bit talking, so I'm going to half read this if you don't mind. But um, anyway, thank you all for coming um, on this very special evening to celebrate the life of a remarkable lady. Erna contributed so much to the travel industry, and I've been privileged to, to work for her all these years. All my working life, as many of you know, I've been surrounded by her endless photos, albums, diaries, press clippings, old films, all telling a story of the life of a lady battling against all odds throughout the 20th century in an age when it was so much harder for women to get ahead. When Erna died in 2001, she left me all her photo albums and scrapbooks, exotic ski and summer brochures, and all her personal scribbles. And they have been hogging cupboard after cupboard after cupboard <laughs> in the old news office in South Kensington. Um, when I was clearing out the office over a year ago, it was probably the longest job I've ever done. Because I couldn't stop myself at actually sitting down and spending hours going through them all. Every photo and every press article painting the picture of a life full to the brim and a devotion to skiing. Now, when I met Steve Keenan at the Aptop conference in, um, in Saint Malo in 2011, we sat and brainstormed together what could be done about this unique archive. And the upshot was that Steve would digitalise the films, um, and he spent many hours at the British Film Institute doing this, and Mark Ferry would tackle the enormous archive and produce a biography of her life. So I see tonight as a celebration of, um, um, of Erna and of actually putting her on public record. Nothing would make me prouder than to see her um, books in libraries and to see the old ancient cine films go viral on the internet. Yeah, yeah. For me to look out here and see so many faces of staff and old friends and people in the industry, that's more important than anything. And I know Erna would have loved that too. So thank you. skis by the way, um, but I didn't make out as well as you did, I, I broke my leg um, on the last, in 1958, a wooden skin on the last day of this, one of Erna's skiing holidays in Seth Faust, I went off piste and um, uh, hit a, and, a, a, and a, the ski, the, the bindings that were released, and it, it put me off skiing for quite a long time, <laughs> as it as, uh, sounded a bit unfortunately. Uh, Anyway, um, uh, it's fantastic to see so many people here um, to honour Erna, and um, I'm more than a little proud to be asked to say a few words uh, uh, about her. Um, she was a very big person in my life, both, uh, both literally and, um, <laughs> and, and figuratively. Uh, as I mentioned in, in the foreword of the book, my, my mother, Uli, in the early 50s, went into 47A, uh, Old Brompton Road, to ask for a temporary job, and she came out with a, a lifetime friendship. Um, Erna, she became, along with Bobby Shafto, um, Erna's right-hand woman, really. She, she uh, organized holidays, she went on all of Erna's um, trips with her, her exploratory trips to do deals with hotels. She, um, she organised her life, really, her, 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 her private life to a large extent. Um, Erna moved in, in this adjacent street to where we lived uh, in South Kensington and um, became really a part of the family, uh, virtually, um, uh, and, until, uh, uh, until my dad got rather jealous of the amount of time that mum was spending with Erna and there was a bit of a... <laughs> friction there, I don't even come around so much after that, but um, she, she, we saw an awful lot of her and, and she, was, she was a formidable woman, uh, as those of you who remember her uh, will know. Hands up, who went to the Olympics this summer? Wasn't it absolutely amazing? Yes. Now, I was lucky enough to go on Super Saturday with my family and I saw Jessica Ennis throwing the javelin on the way to gold. Now, I think what struck me most, though, apart from the amazing atmosphere in this beautiful and thankfully rain-free city, was the uh, sheer determination of all those athletes. Now, it might surprise you that, that this biography, Aiming High, published by Matador, 
which were available in all good booksellers from the 1st of January. Um, it's, it's about a Jessica Ennis of an earlier era. It's about another javelin thrower with seemingly endless amounts of determination. Now, I bet you all thought it was about skiing, didn't you? Now, as well as setting up a ski company, Erna threw the javelin on behalf of her native Austria. She represented them at the Amateur Athletics Championships here in London in 1932. Um, and she threw the javelin in an impressive 107 feet 4 inches. A fact that I learned from my research of the book. Now, Erna came second only to the British record holder at the time, uh, Edith Halstead, who was known to her friends as Eddie. Now, um, when you consider that Eddie Halstead was later found to be Mr. Edwin Halstead, <laughs> Venus achievement becomes all the more remarkable. The the, um, the the office is still the image of that office in, in 47 Brompton Road is still very vivid to me, and to see her name in red, her signature, still invokes really deep emotions for me because I used to pass that almost every day. It was on my run from where I lived in Neville Street to <laughs> South Kent Station, and there it was. Uh, and I, I worked there, my brother and I worked in the, down below in the uh, basement and the Frankie machine, uh, as students this was, earning pocket money really, uh, and it was pocket money, uh, <laughs> uh, on the, on the uh, Frankie machine uh, and, and, and um, addressing letters and that duplicator pre, um, uh, before photocopying machines uh, which involved lots of carbon paper and incredibly uh, intricate Sort of arrangements of paper and ink and things. I believe how, how easy it is now to copy. I never forget actually, I still, to this day, when I photocopy something, think, God, that is so easy. <laughs> <laughs> what we used to have to do with these long, elongated bits of paper and carbon, and, and it went wrong so often, the ink spilled, you had to get the right amount of ink. Very complicated. And, and, and I worked then later when I was older with her uh, in Selma Terrace in her room, uh, proofreading these uh, booklets that she'd written. And, and that, was, that was a very happy time for me. She was very good working with her. And um, she was quite demand, you know, she was a demanding person and she wasn't very patient and she didn't suffer <laughs> fools gladly. But she was very, very generous with her. her her time and, and her money and very loyal um, and um, she was she had a terrific sense of humor and and I used that's where I used to be able to slip under her under her sort of fearsomeness because um, I, I was able to make her laugh which um, was a great pleasure because she used to rock when she she really did laugh <laughs> um, and, and those of you who never saw that side of her might be surprised which time she was first tried as an enemy alien and then ended up working for the BBC translating the speeches of Hitler and Goebbels. She formally set herself up in business as the Erna Lowe Travel Service, recognising that her name had already become something of a guarantee uh, of quality. Now the knowledge that Erna had visited a resort and a hotel herself became something of a trademark. Now she was indefatigable as we've heard. Erna would regularly visit 15 hotels a day on these scouting trips. Now, as someone who's done hotel inspections as a, as a travel journalist, I take my hat off to her. And this personal attention it really shone through in those brochures which she re researched, photographed, and wrote herself, often staying up till five in the morning, hunched over a pen and paper and a box of chocolates. And she would churn them out to companies in the <coughs> produce one or two brochures a year. She would do 15 aimed at different target markets. And reading them today, she comes across as a sort of pre-internet trip advisor. <laughs> now, um, one travel industry reviewer wrote at the time that Erna's brochure always ended up jumbled because it was a hodgepodge of her own ideas and those stolen from other companies <laughs> and subtly improved by Erna. <laughs> that reviewer wrote, her brochure is loved by travel writers seeking something different. It tells you how to sunbathe, for instance. <laughs> it was a formula that attracted the growing British middle class who were only just getting used to the idea that they needed an overseas holiday. At her peak, she was taking tens of thousands of people skiing, taking them to Mediterranean resorts that she discovered for beach holidays and on all sorts of specialist holidays. 
One springs to mind in particular where she took a group of blind people to Vienna so that they could feel the statues in the city parks. We went on, we went on, on her holidays to Cornwall. We went skiing. Um, we, we spent time in her garden because you could sunbathe there. Um, we, we spent a lot of time with her. When, when, I, when I got older and, and moved away, um, in my twenties when I got married, it, we, we, became, we didn't see so much of her and she rather disapproved of some of the choices I made, I think. She was rather critical of my choice of career and worried that I would make a living. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I'm rather sorry she's not around now. Um, <laughs> see that I have managed to make, make a living. Uh, and, and then I, I did see her quite a lot when she, the last few years of her life, which were sad when she had Alzheimer's. And, uh, I remember, you know, Alzheimer's, it's, she, she really had it pretty badly, and, and I, but even so, I, you, could, you could look, you could sometimes see a look in her eye, which would, she knew that something was wrong, she couldn't sort of articulate it, but there was something of Irma there. Um, I, I can't speak about, really, about her legacy uh, in terms of her professional life. Uh, uh, um, in the travel business, because I didn't really know enough about the travel business. I regret that I didn't take up the opportunities that she offered me as a young man to take parties out as a tour leader. I think I had lack of confidence or, or, or didn't feel like I could cope with that, but I wish I had. She was very sort of trusting in, in that sense. Um, she'd, give, she'd give people opportunities. You didn't have to go through hoops. And I think that was true of people who came to work with her. I think it was difficult. Uh, was was difficult working for her, I think, especially if you're a man. Um, but um, <laughs> she she was she wasn't an easy employee, but she she did she gave you opportunities, and, and uh, if you were, were good, she appreciated that. I don't know what she would have made of, of the travel business. Now I think she'd probably be appalled by the the the, the internet. Really, I know so many. <laughs> I can't imagine her dealing with that, but she was very adaptable. Maybe she would have. Um, I know a lot of independent travel businesses have gone bust because of it, and I think it's a credit to Joanne's uh, management of the company that it's doing so well because it, it, it must be hard to compete with that. Um, and, and it's probably a testament to people who, who still want to have a personal touch with their. Um, with the holidays, which is something that she started really. So uh, it was a different age that she lived in, and um, I, for one, am rather sad it's gone in many ways. Thank you very much. And this constant desire to share great places lasted throughout her life, and made the company the success it undoubtedly was and still is. Now I'll hold my hands up now and say I never met her which could be seen as something of a disadvantage for a biographer. Now, this is, uh, but luckily, Erna was an inveterate hoarder. She kept everything, as we heard from Joanna. She kept cuttings, adverts from newspapers, letters to friends and from friends, uh, everything. And, and also, she kept hundreds of pages of notes for an autobiography that she was hoping to write, but sadly never finished. Now, I'm really, really pleased to see so many people here today that are interviewed for this book. Now, interviewing friends and colleagues of a biography subject is always going to be a delicate matter, I think, and those people were rightly protective of Erna's memory and legacy. Now, I hope in Aiming High that I've created a fitting memorial to her great achievements, as well as trying to understand some of those difficult events in her life that made her what she was. Now, I just wanted to end with some of Erna's own words. In the notes of her autobiography, she wrote something that sums up everything about her success, I believe. And I wanted to share that with you. And I won't try to do the accents, although when I was interviewing Robert, he did a very good job at it. So maybe he'll give you that later. Anyway, she said, I came over here in 1931 as a young student with 10 borrowed pounds in my pocket and bags full of optimism. It just never occurred to me that anything could go wrong. The world was there to be explored. And England was a country full of promise and opportunities. I think that's something we can all agree with. So thank you everybody who helped put this book together. Thank you all for coming and have a good night.